Right, so we're moving on into chapter nine today. Chapter nine is about water and air reactive substances. And so primarily what we're going to talk about here are flammable solids. That's the majority of the materials that fit into this category of either being air reactive or water reactive. There are some liquids that go in there as well, but primarily we are talking about solid materials. And so we need to start with kind of our basic definitions of what those two terms mean. So what is a water reactive substance? Well, water reactive substance would be any substance that when we combine it with water, one of two things will happen. Either we will get something that is spontaneously flammable, or we will get something that is either toxic or corrosive. So with water reactive substances, we are not always talking about substances that are flammable. We can be talking about substances that will give reactions that generate toxic gas, reactions that generate acids or bases, reactions that are, you know, indeed flammable as well. So that class of substances is a little bit larger. For air reactive substances, we're talking about substances that when they come into contact with air or with water vapor in the air, they will spontaneously ignite. And so that definition for air reactive is a little bit more narrow. We're not looking for stuff that generates corrosive material or toxic material. Uh, we've got another designation for those. We're looking at specifically things that are going to spontaneously combust. So we expose the substance to air and it reacts with the oxygen in the air or it reacts with the water vapor in the air and it catches on fire. And so there are some subclasses to each of these. Obviously, we're going to want to split the water reactive substances into subgroups based upon what it is that they turn into when they react. Because we're going to treat a substance that is toxic differently than we are one that is flammable. And the same thing for the air reactive substances as well. We're going to treat those that are um, pyrophoric versus those that are self-heating differently because they have different levels of happening. One spontaneously ignites, goes up in a big puff of flame almost immediately. The other one kind of acts as its own ignition source and then ignites. So there's levels of danger to, to each. Looking at the water reactive substances, such reactions are referred to as hydrolysis reactions. Hydrolysis reactions take place when we have water interacting with a chemical substance. And depending upon what it is that is reacting, we can get a variety of things. One of the most common things is a corrosive. So, um, the next lab that you do, the acid base lab, you're going to see examples of hydrolysis reactions. Because what you're going to do, and this kind of goes back to what we just talked about with corrosive materials and with anhydrides, you're going to make anhydrous compounds. 
you're going to take sulfur and you're going to burn it in oxygen to make sulfur dioxide. You're then going to expose that sulfur dioxide to water and in a hydrolysis reaction, that water and sulfur or that water and sulfur dioxide is going to create a combination of products to create sulfurous acid first and foremost. But as we let more oxygen into the chamber, we're going to see some of that reaction continue and the sulfurous acid will actually turn into sulfuric. So that's a hydrolysis reaction. We took the raw material, reacted it with water, and the end result was a corrosive material, in this case, an acid. Same kind of thing happens when we burn metals. When I burn magnesium in the presence of oxygen, I get magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is a white powder solid. When you interact that magnesium oxide with water, a hydrolysis reaction occurs. The result of that hydrolysis reaction is magnesium hydroxide. Magnesium hydroxide is a weak base. So that's one kind of reaction that can take place. Another kind is what we call the dangerous when wet material. Those dangerous when wet materials, um, these are designated um, most commonly in the United States, they are the blue placards that have the uh, flame pictogram on them and the number four. So again, this is a DOT placard. We really would only see that in transport situations um, because of the OSHA laws and the adoption of the global harmonized system. We wouldn't see this placard very often in a workplace situation. But dangerous and wet materials, um, these are substances that are going to react with water. And in their reaction with water, they are either going to produce a flammable substance that spontaneously ignites, or they're going to produce some kind of a toxic gas, usually. It says a toxic product. More often than not, that's a gas that is formed. For substances that are air reactive, synonym of air reactivity is something called pyrophoria. Those substances are called pyrophoric substance. What we're talking about there are liquids or solids that will react rapidly when they are exposed to atmospheric oxygen, and that reaction is going to be enough to ignite them. Depending upon the nature of the substance, you'll find that they are often going to be stored in um, conditions like under oil or in non-aqueous liquids like maybe kerosene or other kinds of solvents, or they're going to be kept more or less under vacuum in enclosed oxygen-free dry atmospheres. Now, again, depending upon the nature of the substance, we can also see it in other ways as well. White phosphorus is a pyrophoric substance. Most common way of storing white phosphorus is underwater because it's not water reactive. So you store it underwater, it gets blocked out from atmospheric oxygen. But these are the kinds of substances that we do not want to see anywhere near oxygen because they will ignite and they will ignite quickly and they will ignite rapidly and usually get out of control quite quickly. Especially if there's a lot of big small amounts, you know, that usually can be contained pretty well. But usually with these kinds of substances, we're not talking about small amounts. Water, 
white phosphorus. Um, so white phosphorus, uh, yeah, the white phosphorus is an unstable form of phosphorus. That's why it's so reactive. The phosphorus that we usually find in the ground or that is part of you know other kinds of reactive ores, that's usually the red or the purple variety. Um, so white phosphorus, um, because of its air reactivity, usually doesn't exist in the natural state. You can kind of push it toward un an unnatural state, but you're right. If it was that reactive, we would see it as like P2O5 or um, P4O10, well before we ever could dig it out of the ground. So the pro the process of creating it, um, I don't know all the specifics of it. I um, I'm only kind of rationalizing here, but I would imagine you have to go backwards into its characterization, find a way to stress red phosphorus to get it to go to the more unstable form, and then as you're doing that, you do that reaction in some kind of safe environment. And then you store it. Now, because of their dangers, OSHA does require that manufacturers and distributors and importers get put the flame pictogram on all the labels. So if it merely ignites, you'll see the flame pictogram on, on those. If it creates flammable gases on contact with water, you'll see both the flame and the exploding bomb pictogram as well. So again, that's a, that's a way that we can identify multiple hazards at the same time. So that's one of the differences between the DHS system and the old DOT system. The DOT system would just change the color of the placard. Um, the DHS system allows you to fix multiple placards on the same shipping container. So what we're looking at here is, again, kind of the difference between, is this merely pyrophoric? Is this merely a flammability risk? Or in the process of igniting, does this also generate flammable gases? Does this generate um, something that could potentially um, build up pressure and be an explosion risk? When we look at water reactive substances as far as shipping is concerned, generally speaking, we're talking about, you know, again, subcategories here. Um, there are regulations in place for substances that would be classified as dangerous when wet. There are slightly different ones for slim, flammable solids, for some that are spontaneously combustible, for those that are corrosive. DOT requires placarding for everything that goes out into transport, whether it's through shipment, carrier, um, foreign, well, not foreign, but domestic, train, track, um, big rig, you know, you name the mode of transport. Um, it's going to have to have the proper labeling systems on. Um, the, that labeling system can include the colored placards that we saw from the DOT. They will always include the DHS placards as well, at least in some kind of form or fashion. Um, if 
not on the shipping container itself, but certainly on the, the box or whatever the material is. So just as a reminder, those three categories, um, we carry uh, category four placards on the DOT. Um, so depending upon the nature of the substance, we already discussed the dangerous one, wet one, that one's blue. Um, there's also the half red, half white, for spontaneous and combustible, and the striped red and white for um, flammable solid. And then corrosive materials, that's a category eight. And we just talk, finished talking about that one. That's the black and white placard that has the, uh, the hands and the piece of metal with the, it's the corrosive uh, 50 grain. The same one as VHX. All right, let's take a look at some examples of some of these substances that fit into these categories. And we're going to start with kind of the most common. The most common flammable solids out there are alkali metals. Remember, alkali metals are any of the metals in group one of the periodic table. So we're looking at the lithium group, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. Now, of those five, uh, we'll throw out francium because francium is radioactive. But of those five, the most common ones we're going to encounter are lithium, sodium, and potassium. Rubidium and cesium just aren't as common as metals. Now, all three of these alkali metals will spontaneously ignite if we provide them the correct stimulus. And the correct stimulus is not just simply holding it up in the air. We have to introduce a little bit of heat to get the party started. But if you heat up those samples of metal, they will eventually ignite on their own. Now, the other thing that alkali metals do, where they fit into this category in particular, is they are highly reactive with water. And you will actually do this reaction next week in the acid base lab. And if not there, certainly in the um, lab that's after that. Um, the, one where we uh, deal with um, flame chemistry. So what happens in these reactions is this. The Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, that's an alkaline earth metal, not an alkaline metal.
But what happens is the alkali metal will react with the water, and two things happen. First of all, the metal will start to fizz, and the fizz that is coming off, the gas that is coming off, is hydrogen gas. In addition to that hydrogen gas, we also get a basic material, lithium hydroxide. Now, as we go down the periodic table, these reactions intensify. Metallic activity and reactivity generally increases as you go down the columns. So lithium kind of is the weakest of the group. Sodium is a little bit better. Potassium is a little bit better still. Rubidium and cesium obviously are better than those, but again, they're far more rare. But what we'll see is that because lithium is not nearly as reactive, the reaction that occurs is slower and then it doesn't generate as much heat. And as a result, the hydrogen gas that forms doesn't ignite on its own. There's just not enough heat present to do it. But for the sodium and the potassium, it does. Now, in the lab that we give you, where you do this, we're not going to give you a big enough piece of sodium to have it spontaneously ignite into flame because that presents a whole other series of, of issues that we have to deal with in the laboratory. But if we have a large enough piece of sodium, yes. Um, the kind of cool thing that happens is that um, it generates so much hydrogen so quickly that even though the metal is more dense than water, it floats. Because it's generating so much hydrogen that the hydrogen evol evolving basically pushes it up to the top. And this is in contrast, because you'll do magnesium and calcium at the same time. And magnesium and calcium don't generate nearly as much hydrogen, at least not as quickly. And so even though the calcium will look like it, it's just bubbling furiously, it's not bubbling up enough to actually push that calcium sample to the surface of the water. And it's not generating enough heat energy to ignite the hydrogen that forms. So those are the alkali metals. Now, a little bit about each. Metallic lithium, it's soft. It's kind of a silvery metal. Under normal conditions, not terribly dense, it'll float in a lot of uh, low density petroleum products. Um, we actually store lithium metal usually in some form of a mineral oil and even the large rods of of lithium will try to float on it and as you cut them down as you use them um once it becomes long enough once you cut it down enough that it no longer kind of angles inside of the bottle it floats on top of the oil um you just take a pair of tweezers and you go and you grab one of the rods and you can cut it with a butter knife. How soft it is. In water, it remains solid phase. It oxidizes very slowly. The hydrogen evolution that comes from it is not terribly fast. and it will not spontaneously burn in dry air. But if we introduce it to an ignition source, and this is, this is um, you know, we won't do this reaction in particular, but you could. <laughs> what we'll show you instead is we can show you the oxidation Um, we can take that same knife that we're using to cut it, 
and we can just kind of scrape off a little bit of the lithium oxide and expose that fresh metal underneath. And what we'll see is that it reacts with the oxygen pretty quickly, turns black again within a matter of seconds. But that's really all it does. Doesn't generate nearly enough energy, isn't nearly reactive enough to do more than that. If you hold it up to a flame, it will ignite. Again, we're not going to do that in the lab that day. But the products of that reaction, should you do it, would be lithium oxide and lithium nitride, where it's just reacting with the oxygen in the air, it's reacting with the nitrogen in the air. Some of the uses for lithium include just as raw materials. Um, it is used in certain types of ceramic uh, manufacturing, glass manufacturing, where we know it the most common though is in batteries. Most high-end electronics feature lithium ion batteries because lithium ion batteries have two primary advantages. You can get a lot of power out of them and they're lightweight. Um, and again, if you look at the periodic table, you look at that molar mass of lithium, lithium is the lightest metal that we have. And it's very well suited for electronic exchange. That's the other big important part of a battery. You have to have the ability for the electrons to flow somewhere, right? Well, any of those alkali metals, because they are one electron lost away from gaining a noble gas configuration, getting to a stability state, exactly what they want to do. They're very prone to giving up electrons. You just need to find something to take those electrons and create the circuit to make a battery. And so um, electrochemists figure out how to do that, how to do it in such a way that doesn't expose the lithium to water. Um, it's not actually metallic lithium, usually it's a combination of lithium ion compounds and kind of uh, a piece uh, to limit water. There are other applications for lithium. Uh, you can see here for like gear expansion glass, fungicides, pharmaceuticals, greases. Again, batteries are probably what we best know it for. Speaking of those batteries, we have in lithium metal batteries, disposable batteries that are not rechargeable. Those are kind of the first generation lithium ion batteries. Most of the ones that we're talking about are secondary batteries. Um, where they are like your phone battery, the battery in your tablet, in your laptop. Um, where they're rechargeable. The composition inside of that battery can change quite considerably, but the thing that you have to worry about why we have to have proper disposal mechanisms for electronic batteries is because of what they contain. Not so much the lithium that we're concerned about, it's usually that piece that solution that is inside of the battery that helps to transport the charge. And when we charge it, reverse the charge so that the battery can work again. That substance is usually is flammable. And um, there are sometimes, not always, but sometimes there are either toxic materials or 
just otherwise things that you don't want going into a land sale. Um, because that's the thing that you have to think about when you throw something away is what kind of environment is it going into and can it survive that environment without causing some kind of fire or some kind of chemical reaction. Most batteries, most dry cell batteries, they're not great. The things that you try to prevent from getting into landfills just because they're corrosive and some of the metals aren't exactly the greatest things in the world to get into the ground. But there's no real flammability risk from any of them either. And that's why if you look at kind of uh, the regulations for environmental concerns regarding normal alkaline batteries, you'll see a variety of answers. A lot of groups will say you need to store them, you need to keep them, um, you need to dispose of them at a proper disposal facility. Others will say it's okay to throw them in the trash. It's really not going to do that much harm. You get kind of both sides of the argument. The reason why is because it kind of cuts both ways. But for lithium ion batteries, there's complete agreement. That electrolyte is flammable. And if you put it into a landfill and the uh, battery decomposes and degrades, that flammable electrolysis or that flammable electrolyte can get leached out, catch on fire, and now we have a landfill fire. And we're putting a whole bunch of stuff up into the atmosphere that we really don't want in the atmosphere. Metallic sodium. Primary uses for metallic sodium are raw materials uh, to help in the production of sodium hydroxide, um, sodium peroxide, and sodium hydride. So there aren't a whole lot of uses for sodium metal other than the production of other sodium products that are more common. We do see metallic sodium used from time to time in um, rubber production uh, for the creation of synthetic rubbers. Um, we can find that metallic sodium is entered into that process as a catalyst. Remember, catalysts speed up the rate of reaction. So the metallic sodium in that case doesn't really it participates in the reaction, but it also gets generated at the end of the reaction series. So it doesn't fully get used up, but it does make the reaction go faster. There are also occasions, although I'm not exactly sure what um, specific materials are being referenced here, but there are some commercial alloys that do contain sodium in them. Um, Putting the sodium into an alloy does reduce some of its reactivity. But again, I'm not exactly sure what these applications are. I know that sodium is kind of soft as a metal, so I'm not exactly sure why one would want to add it to other metal samples. I'm not sure exactly what properties it would give the metal that would be advantageous. Um, it doesn't lose its reactivity fully, but the mixing with the other metals does tamper, it does dampen the reactivity somewhat. Now, like lithium, like other um, like uh, the other alkali metals, sodium is going to react very rapidly with water. Its reaction is going to cause the spontaneous ignition of hydrogen. 
And the primary reason for that is we're talking about a reaction that is that a lot more vigorous, a lot more energetic. And when it ignites, what's going to happen is it's going to continue to ignite the hydrogen as it is being generated by the metal reacting with water. So the hydrogen doesn't have a chance to just kind of make its way out of there. As soon as it ignites, the reaction keeps going and going and going until we run out of sodium metal. Because once we run out of sodium metal, the hydrogen source ceases to exist as well. So when we see the reaction with water, we get two things happening. We get the production of the sodium hydroxide. We also get the production of hydrogen. And the hydrogen is able to react with oxygen. produce hot water vapor. Now, because of its reactivity and its affinity for oxygen, nit um, nitrogen, which is generally a little bit more inert, a little less reactive, isn't going to react with sodium. So we're not going to get sodium nitride like we got lithium nitride. Instead, we're going to get reactions solely with oxygen because of the reactivity of the two together. And so we're either going to get sodium oxide, Na2O, or sodium peroxide, Na2O2. Those are the primary byproducts of the reaction, the combustion of sodium metal. If we get pieces of sodium that are small enough and have a high enough surface area, they will ignite spontaneously at room temperature. The Ignition of sodium will always give a yellow flame because that is kind of the characteristic color of sodium. Um, now, you'll do flame testing in a couple of weeks. That flame testing is a large result. The colors that you see have a lot to do with where the electrons are in those atom samples and how they are able to maneuver to higher states and lower states. Um, so the reason that sodium is yellow instead of red or instead of uh, blue or green has a lot to do with kind of the positioning of its electrons. But again, the key word here is non-bulk. So what we're really talking about is Things like powders, dust, things with high surface area. If I take a piece of sodium metal out of our container, you know, looks kind of like a rock. Um, it's rock-like status is primarily because we've gotten it to slowly oxidize. And so it's got a nice oxide crust on it. But even if I were to cut that open and hold it up, it's not going to spontaneously ignite because there's just not enough surface area present. But once again, if I take one of those larger pieces, introduce it to an ignition source, it would burn and it would burn with a yellow flame. In the presence of dry air, the oxidation process does not happen particularly fast, um, but in moist air, you can see it pretty rapidly. 
Uh, again, when we do that lab, we'll cut a sample of the sodium metal for you to see. It'll appear as a shiny silver for about a second, and then it'll go back to like a whitish dull consistency. Again, very fast for that kind of work. But again, we're not talking about a dry environment, we're talking about a there's humidity in our air. It's not just dry air. Generally, sodium is stored under kerosene. That's how we store ours here. Um, and that reduces its ignition potential because it blocks out the oxygen source. Can't store it under water because it reacts with water. Um, kerosene is generally the uh, material of choice for storage. So what, what can be done is um, it can, you can cut the pieces smaller, you can pulverize it in a non-oxygenated environment and store it and then it, it can break out when it's necessary. Um, so usually when we talk about things like that, it's kind of a, a byproduct of something like that. Potassium. Metallic potassium actually has very few uses. And in fact, getting pure metallic potassium is on the rarer side. One of the primary reasons for that, again, if we follow our trend here, Potassium is even more reactive than the sodium is. So as a result, we're going to get a rarity of it just because it's lower on the periodic table. We're also going to get a rarity of the pure element <coughs> because it's so reactive with oxygen, it's just going to make oxides. And those oxides are usually generated, we have a substance that is a lot more pyrophoric, a lot more reactive to the air. So, and depending upon the form, um, we're going to see a, a variety of different kind of forms. So potassium oxide, K2O is probably the most common. If we burn in pure oxygen, we can get a mixture of potassium oxide, K2O. We can get potassium peroxide, K2O2. Or we can get um, potassium superoxide, which is kind of an interesting form as well, KO2. Uh, uh, superoxides are two oxygen atoms that have a negative one charge as opposed to a negative two or a negative four. Um, so they're kind of different in that regard um, and pretty rare as well. Potassium also will react with water and again, What you have happening there is a couple of things. You've got the potassium reacting with water to make potassium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And then the hydrogen gas is able to react with oxygen to make water vapor. And the heat of that reaction can then force the potassium to react with the oxygen. To make potassium oxide. So it's kind of a series of steps. 
the water generates the hydrogen, the hydrogen burns, the energy of the hydrogen burning creates enough energy to burn the potassium. Now they're all burning all at once. And the whole thing goes until we run out of potassium. So that's where we're gonna stop for today. On Monday, we will pick up with more combustible metals. These are metals that are not nearly as dangerous, but do have some important characteristics that we wanna look into. And uh, we'll keep working our way through chapter nine here. Have a great weekend.